Welcome to the Living to 100 Club podcast. Well, hello to everyone joining us today on our podcast. You're listening to one of our successful aging episodes this month on the Living to 100 Club program. And I'm your host, Joe Kashiani. Each program, our conversations educate and inspire, helping you get the best out of all the years we're given, regardless of what obstacles come our way. You can learn more about my club at our website. Be sure to take a look at my new training and activities manual, Better, Longer, and Happier, A Guide to Aging with Purpose and Positivity. This is a series of 12 modules in a card deck format developed for activities directors at senior living communities to learn more about psychologically healthy aging and to engage senior residents in activities that are cognitively challenging and foster a positive mindset. Modules one through nine are on sale now. Visit my website, livingto100.club forward slash BLH. Now on to today's program. Our guest on our podcast today is Dr. Marjorie Burns, who prefers to go by Baiji as her first name. In this conversation, we learn about Baiji's latest period of her life as the author of a new book of fiction, The New Cadets. And we learn about her attitude to keep it moving. Now in her 80s, our guest hikes, bicycles, and skis in her home state of Washington. She has a 20-foot, 27-foot climbing wall in her home, which she puts to good use. Why does she stay so physically active? Does her chronological age ever tell her to slow down? As a writer of academic books, papers, and journal articles, how did she come to write a children's book? And what was the inspiration for the new cadets? And how would this new series of children books unfold? First, a little background. Marjorie Burns, author of The New Cadets, was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. She studied at the University of California, earning her Ph.D. with a dissertation on fantasy and children's literature in 19th century England. She taught English literature and writing at Portland State University for more than 30 years. And she's, a, she's published extensively in her field, largely on the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien. She's now retired from university teaching and lives in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Baiji, welcome to our program today. It's kind of fun to have someone using my nickname, Baiji. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> they, these uh, programs have always been Marjorie, but Baiji is what people who know me well call me. Yeah. How, how did that come to be, by the way? That's an unusual name, a beautiful, a pretty name. How did it come I to be? Yeah. Uh, when I was two years old, I couldn't say Marjorie, and don't tell me or do tell me how I got Marjorie <laughs> turned into Baiji, but um, the name stuck with me, and even the grade school teachers called me Baiji. Still sticks with me. Wow, <laughs> okay. Uh, no dignity at my age to still being called Baiji. You know, what can I say? Well, we're not too concerned about ego these days, are we? No. Nope. Yeah. It goes <laughs> as you get older, I think, <laughs> or it should. So, I always like to open by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about the journey that brought you to where you are today. Yeah. Accomplished a lot, teaching, writing, doing a lot of uh, outdoor sports and events. Um, what are some of the highlights that brought you to where you are today? I thought about that question. And uh, I think even when I was young, I wanted it all. I wanted to have children, husband. I um didn't know what the rest of the all meant, but it ended up being several things, the university teaching being one of them. And I also thought that I, I've i lived uh, more than one life. I suppose I live as Marjorie, mm -hmm. 
the formal person, Baiji, the less formal person, and I've traveled a lot. I've lived um, in France as an exchange student in high school, so I have competent French, and I lived in Norway twice, the second time under a Fulbright uh, professorial scholarship, so I was teaching, and I I love the Norwegians, and Norwe- Norwegian is a fairly easy language, too. Mm. Um, so I think if you learn other languages and you live in other cultures, and if you read books about other lives, you live more than one life. Yeah. You have that experience. And and Joe, do you speak another language? Uh, no, no, I've studied several, but I don't speak any currently. Yeah. But if you've ever spoken any, even not much, yeah. You, you feel like somehow you're a different person living somewhat of a different life. Yeah. So you would understand that. And I, I've had a lot of lives and I thought, well, here I start and then I spread out, try something else. But what you try out comes back together to being you. And so, mm. and lots of friends. I mm-hmm. don't think you have to travel or speak another language to uh, to do that, to live other lives. Mm-hmm. But the more you do it, the more you listen to other people, not just talk about yourselves as I am having to do here today. Uh-huh. Sure. It's a funny thing to me. Talk about me. You 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 gain, you learn from other people. And we keep evolving and we keep um, opening new doors, as I say. That's right. There's a, a quote that I love and I can't think of her name, but uh, she said, I've already lost touch with a couple of people I used to be. Yeah, uh, famous writer. I can't think of her name. It'll come to me. But I, I think it is, as you say, um, just going, experiencing different cultures, learning new languages, encountering new people, new friendships, and it helps us to to evolve and grow. Yeah. New ideas. Um, new ideas. Anyone yeah. who has time yeah. on the web nowadays, the scientific learnings that are coming through, being on Mars. I, I just amazing. There are new things all the time. I sometimes have found myself saying, maybe in the last twenty years, boy, I'm glad I didn't die last year. I know so much more this year. And I don't mean yeah. just science. I mean yeah. to be human, about how to be human and how to be the best self. And then the next year I'll say, Boy, I'm glad I didn't die that year. Yeah. I know more now. Yeah. And and it's a delight. Yeah, so much richer, right? I mean, it's a rich life. Yeah, not financially, of course, but rich life. But so, the past day, go ahead, please. No, go ahead. The past days with us. Um, I've been finding in this publishing this book and somehow getting public attention more that people keep talking about me as an octogenarian. Now, you haven't reduced me to that, but some people have. And I think mm. I wasn't born an octogenarian. I was all these other things and life isn't a bus that drops you off at one bus stop and then you're a toddler and another, another bus stop and you're a teenager and then a young married person. Hmm. You, it's more like a train where all the things you've been, they stay with you. I have such, such vivid memories of my childhood and they're they're still there. And and the age is, is a, I think it's more of a distraction sometimes. It's the chronological age anyway. It doesn't, Sure. It's only a number. And um, it's, if we can set it aside, I think we do better. That's that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Mine too. Yeah, because, uh, you know, but we start thinking of the number and people start saying, well, I don't know if I should be doing that at my age. I don't think I should, you know, I should limit myself more. And I think that's just unfair to ourselves. Yeah. Sure. We have to to yeah. some extent. Yeah. Well, because we can't, but not to tell ourselves we can't. Sure. Right. I mean, so what does successful okay. aging mean to you? What, what? How would you define successful aging? Keep doing the things you like. Hmm. I'm active. I don't like gyms particularly, except for rock climbing gyms. Hmm. Um, but I have nothing against them. Other people do. So I can I I go outside as much as I can. And I climb indoors on the climbing wall. Not as much as I should, but I just did it again to the top the other day, saying. I've got to keep doing this mm. um, if I'm going to say I do it. and mm. But mostly I do things because I want to. Yeah. I have a, a friend in the community, a retired judge, a little younger than I, who says, 
when he's on a bicycle, he feels like a 10 year old kid again. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I'm on my bicycle, Mm -hmm. just flying along effortlessly. And the same when the snow is right where I live near Mm -hmm. the mountains, you can go out on skis. You can just skim over the world. You don't feel 80. Nothing like it at all. Um, Other things I do more lightly. I don't do class four whitewater kayaking anymore. It's very little incline or a flat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's fine. I'm still doing it. And that the feeling of moving your boat is a mm-hmm. wonderful yeah. feeling. Yeah. yeah, and that's as you say, keep doing what you love and you're you're very active physically, the climbing wall. Twenty seven feet, that's I think I asked you, that's probably more than two stories if you look at it really is two stories. It's yeah. um from the middle floor up to the roof. Yeah. It has an overhang at the last so that you have to kind of lean back oh, and and uh, work a yeah. little harder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen the mountain climbers do that and step, you know, kind of reaching back. And it's mind boggling that they can do that. So kudos to you for doing it yourself. Yeah. So um, what gives purpose? What gives you meaning in your life? What? What puts a smile on your face when you wake up in the morning? The dogs, usually waking me up. <laughs> the older one come, rawr, rawr. her name is Talkie. She was a rescue dog named Talkie because she, she talks like that. <laughs> and they wake me up and their tails are wagging. And how can you not feel joy when someone is, is wagging a tail like that? Mm-hmm. Glad to see you and glad another day is starting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have out my window... The mountain this is very close by, covered with snow all year round, and uh, it's it's a wonderful world, like mm-hmm. the Louis Armstrong um, mm-hmm. song goes. So um, the dogs, that's great. Um, <laughs> you have family that is around, supports you, and do. encourages you, and do. gives you a lot of um, energy. I have four children, uh-huh. and for a while, all four of them were living in Portland, Oregon. They'd be close. Now one still lives in Portland, and one is in Port Townsend, mm. and um, two of them live right here. My second mm. son, Matthew, lives on the third floor oh. of the house, and I have a, now a small space, which you can some of which you can see behind me. Sure. Um, and uh, down here, which is just fine, when you've cleaned house for decades, it's very nice to have less to clean. And mm-hmm. we share the middle floor with the kitchen is and take turns cooking. And next door, my oldest son bought uh, eight mm-hmm. some acres mm-hmm. and uh, he and his wife live there. So the mm-hmm. two brothers can help each other out. And um, and we're all pretty independent. Matthew, who lives with me, we both like a lot of alone time. We don't bother each other, but we enjoy each other. Sure, sure. It's all very nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's a comfortable uh, home, home setting. I like that. Yeah. He's out clearing the irrigation ditches uh-huh. today because the water is going to be turned on again uh-huh. tomorrow. Got to be ready. Well, homeowner has many chores. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't go away. So um, speaking of chronological age and things that you love to do are there some things from your past that you you've had to give up that you cannot do anymore in a sense i have this memory i can hardly believe it's true my mother and grandmother were playing cards in front of fireplace at uh, my family home where i grew up and there was a space between their table and the fireplace of mm, maybe two feet I don't know what made me do it, but I looked across the living room, jumped the card table and landed. And they looked up and laughed. I don't think I could do that ever oh, again. Mm, probably, um, well, you probably haven't tried. Like that long jumps that yeah. I can't do. Um, but basically, swim. Mm-hmm. I, I pretty much can do everything that I mm-hmm. enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. Well, have you ever done any mountain climbing? Other than yes, the I climbed Mount Adams a few times. Um, yeah. The yeah. Mount Hood. Yeah. I've, I've trekked up high in Nepal um, to the base mm-hmm. of Mount Everest mm-hmm. and Bhutan. Uh, we didn't mm-hmm. climb those mountains, but I was right up there. What I'm hearing, 
by G, what I'm inferring is that you don't put a lot of um, limits on yourself. You don't have a lot of self-limiting thoughts. You're just continuing to be who you are and do what you like and go after those things that bring you some reward. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's important. Lucky. I think that's important because we do we do tend to limit ourselves sometimes. So how do you how do you divide your your day between leisure and your writing? How do you tell us a typical day for you? I get up a little lazy, have a cup of tea, um, don't drink much coffee. I always say that I'm sort of naturally caffeinated, and you don't want to see me <laughs> under the influence all dithery. Of much caffeine and I look a little bit of the news in my tablet and then I usually do some writing uh, for a while and then the dogs come along and one or the other will come up their nose and lift my arm from the computer time oh. to get out so we oh. walk out in the fields and let them dig for underground rodents or we bike I bike mm -hmm. they run or mm -hmm. ski mm -hmm. And I do something with them. And um, then there's always housework and yard work. And mm -hmm. for a long time, for for a couple of weeks last fall, we were um, splitting wood from two tall, tall mm -hmm. pine trees that had to come down, both of mm -hmm. them, all three of them, probably around 100 feet. And, and so there's that work is is there, sure. running the splitter tossing the wood there's 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 work like that and vacuuming which i don't like mm -hmm. housework is mm -hmm. necessary yeah. and there so um it isn't on a schedule it's not a schedule okay but it, that's okay. basically how a day will go and okay. then working again writing again in the afternoon but it's uh i don't have a rigid schedule and i don't have a fitness program mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay more just, fluid yeah, other than have... standing on one foot or the other when I brush my teeth, that's the only <laughs> fitness program I. That's a routine. Yeah. Well, balance is good. Balance is good, and brushing our teeth with a non-dominant hand and doing all those right. different things. Sure, right. sure. Well, tell us about your your book, The New Cadets. It's it's the first in a series, as I recall. It is. Yeah, tell us about the the plot of The New Cadets, and we'll talk about the series. Uh, the plot, the plot, may I say something about the origin of it? Because oh, that's yes. sure, sure. why the plot exists. Okay. My oldest grandson, who's now six foot four and going on 24, at about age five or six, was having night terrors, terrible nightmares. And so I bought him an almost full sized um, uh, stuffed toy, about three quarter size, and told him it was a service dog trained to work in dreams. And that, of course, it's a toy in the day, but at night, obviously, if it's mm. a toy in the day, obviously at night in dreams, it's alive, which made perfect sense to his idea of logic at the age he was. Mm. And and this dog that he named Oliver, he saw in his dreams, he told me he saw Oliver there. Did it make a big difference? <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but it didn't hurt. And it started me writing first some um, sort of, newsletters from a place I invented called Snooze News. And from that, I started writing the story of how these dogs are recruited in um, toy stores, taken off to be trained, where they gain the ability to move. They become flesh ant dogs when they, they go through a tunnel into this world. And uh, there they have to learn what it is to have a living body, which allowed me didn't plan to do this, but I get to talk about what it is to have a body and to have a spirit. They have to learn about eating, which they take to rather readily. They mm -hmm. are dogs, talking dogs. And uh, they have to learn about toilets even. And and uh, mm -hmm. I had, my publisher said to me, well, they want to be real dogs. And I went, no, no, it's not Pinocchio. Pinocchio was the puppet that wanted to be a real boy. These dogs are quite happy when they go back and get their clients and their toys that uh -huh. can now know are well trained in accompanying their clients in dreams. They uh, mm -hmm. their their original ambition was to be a personal toy, and they're quite content doing that. Mm -hmm. Though they like the mobility, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a world of magic. But I've become a little 
jaded with um, spell casting wand waving magic. So the magic is is more just what the world is like like this world. We forget how magical it is, and that's something that's come back to me as I'm older. Yeah, okay. and maybe not so caught up in work and and raising a family, but how absolutely amazing the world is. Mm. I look at things, and it it seems to me. It seems to me, I can only guess a little bit, that I'm seeing the world again the way I did when I was a child, just, you know, just with awe. At any rate, this, the world has, for example, the, the world they go to has a place called the Variable Sea. Every, every uh, 12 hours and 25 minutes, it changes to something else. Probably another sea, maybe a large lake. Once they see it, it's a pond. Um and and so you can't control it. You can't wave a wand and make it do this or that. It does what it does. And it's just like it is for us in this world. We have to adjust. We have to go along with what's there. And in a lower valley below where the academy is, where the dogs are going to school, uh, only dogs can go down there. Humans try to go down and they break out into a sweat and they mm. I can't do it. I can't do it. The dogs can, and down there they meet some elements that you find in dreams, which are called the mood elements, moodies, they're normally called. Now and then there's a storm that sends these moods up from the valley to the upper valley, and all the people and all the dogs are feeling whatever mood is hitting. They might be mm. uh, modeling and, and saying, I've always, always thought you were such a good friend, and weepy, or they might be in a hilarious mood laughing and falling down on the ground or sad or angry at each other it was a wonderful chapter to write when a hostility storm hits these people and they're all sort of snarling at each other and mm. snapping at each other it was it was a uh, fun to write that and then from the lower valley is one of the ways you can get into the dream world the world of dreams whichever you want to call it and these moodies are still in that world and there mm -hmm. are other creatures that will either herd them towards a dreamer and create the dream they want you to have so they mm -hmm. can get the feeding from it that they like. Or, or they go around and just find one there. Sometimes groups of different type of these dream creatures will work together. And mm. that's what makes a dream. It's your memories. Mm. Mm. They draw mm. on your memories. Yeah. And great fun writing a haunted house one because I had a dream like that as a child where Oh. There's a horrible house alone, and you find yourself going up the steps. You don't want to go in, but you do. Hmm. I don't know if other people have had that dream, but I'm compelled to go in. And once in, it's dark, and there's a sense of horrible things off of the sides. But I have to go up the stairs. Yeah. I have to go up, and I'll maybe go up more stairs, more stairs, until I panic and run out, and things are chasing me. I always survive. But that dream is basically there in, in my story, too. Dreams sure. I remember from my childhood, yeah. making myself do yeah. something I didn't want to do. Very vivid fantasy. It, yeah. it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. There's no, you know, there's no walls to it. There's no, there's no constraints. It's just how it unfolds. Another one I had... I think it's recurring. I'm not sure as a child. And I'm standing on the edge of a cliff and it's night. And behind me is a restaurant with windows. And you, you can see inside light and people talking. I'm there at the edge of this cliff with just darkness beyond. And I have to jump. Mm. You're a psychologist. How mm. would you interpret that? Mm. Mm. Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know later if you have any idea. I think I will. Yeah, maybe we can have that conversation another time. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're bringing the dreams into the writing, or a yes. couple of dreams anyway. Yeah. Did you oh, jump? Several, uh, and there are going to be more. Did you jump on the cliff, off the cliff? I did. In the, what? In the dream, I jump off the cliff. You did jump. Nothing okay. bad happens. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And you incorporated that into the book? That isn't there yet, but it will be. Yeah, I, I wrote um, two volumes of the book. Yeah. 
and the publisher, Paul, said, break it into two books each volume. So the book that's coming out is uh, half of volume one. Had to shift things to make a, a good conclusion to book one. Okay. And then book two is basically ready to go, though I know there's a lot more proofreading. It is so easy, yeah. even trade, in yeah. this sort of thing to make a mistake and not see it. You get so used to reading there. You read what you want to see. Mm. And uh, book three and four are pretty well done, and I'm working on book five. So mm. we are. But the leaping off the cliff isn't there yet. Oh, it's not there yet. Okay. Maybe two. Maybe number two. Maybe three. Yeah. Four, five, it'll be there. So is the new Cadets volume one of the four? Yes. Okay. And what's the series again? I forget the series. The Dream Ranger series. The Dream Rangers, yeah. Those are what the dogs become when they get trained. They're Dream Rangers. Wow. Okay. Hmm. And uh, it's fascinating that you you had this specialty your whole career in uh, writing and children's fantasy, and you... You did your whole dissertation on um, children's fantasy in 19th century England and literature. I mean, that's 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 pretty unique. Are, are there a lot of people with that specialty? I know. Um, I have a good friend who's still teaching at Portland State, but I wasn't most. I wasn't teaching children's literature, but I did mm. teach a lot of uh, Tolkien, which was he and C.S. Lewis show up at the end of my dissertation because they were born Victorians. Uh -huh. But mostly I was dealing with people you might not know of John Ruskin and William Makepeace Thackeray and no, people don't like know those names. No, yeah. It doesn't matter if you do or don't. Yeah. Um, very, very good writers. George MacDonald. Hmm. Mm -hmm. another Andrew Lang who collected the fairy books, the red fairy book, the green fairy book. He wrote some things of his own. Anyhow, yeah. uh, I didn't really teach those things so much. I was teaching, mm. and I love teaching Dickens and uh, mm. George Eliot okay. and Hardy and the Brontes. And I, mm. and my I, after I'd been teaching Dickens for a while, my father, I think, told me that um, his uh, grandmother had gone to church with Dickens in, in Rochester, England. Oh, wow. Be wow. Dickens any better, but uh, it's kind of fun. Some I, connection there, sure. Yeah. Sure, I really, really so, like Dickens. I told myself a few days ago I'm going to read maybe David Copperfield again. Mm. It's time to do it. Mm -hmm. Where does the where does the fantasy come from in your writing? I mean, that's probably a difficult question. But where 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 does it surface from? Where does it bubble up from? Is it primary process? No. No sensor. I mean, what, where, where does it come from? Well, my father would read to us, mm. and I remember him reading The Wind in the Willows, a wonderful, wonderful book. My brother and sister rolling around laughing on the carpet. I was too young to get it. But I know now it also influenced Tolkien quite a bit. Uh. Um, and he would read me the Oz books. Those are the main memories. Mm -hmm. Or he would cite pieces from Hiawatha things like that mm -hmm. and uh i read a lot uh and i wanted to have the kind of adventures you read about i remember climbing out the window at night and s sitting on the slanted roof and mm -hmm. saying you know i'm here i am so sincere you know can't i be taken away and and have a have a wonderful adventure mm -hmm. i even have a faint memory of one day resenting my parents and thinking it's so unfair. They're such good parents. If I only had bad parents, I could run away and have adventures. <laughs> it means, which yeah. tells you, you can never win as a parent. Yeah. There's always, sure. even being good yeah. can be criticized. You can always find something, right? You always find something. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to have those yeah. Yeah. wonderful, thrilling adventures. Okay. All right. I didn't not to dis discover C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories until I was mm. older. Mm. So, yeah, so a lot of the reading, hearing the stories growing up, and then allowing yourself to have these fantasies about where would you go if you ran away and what would you do? And Right. And, and unlimited, right? Unlimited possibility, unlimited doors to open. Yeah. Wow. So um, congratulations on, on volume one and um, sounds like two and 
certainly on its way, and probably three and four are close to the surface. Close to completion, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are your goals for the next year, would you say? What are your goals for writing? Do you think you stay with this series? Well, yes, I would go on, make sure that um, book two gets out and I have friends who proofread for me. Everybody finds something. Nobody finds it all, I find, in mm. proofreading. And, um, and then uh, pushing forward in book five, I also have um, an essay I'd like to get out, a literary criticism one. And that's on the King of the Golden River by John Ruskin, whose name mm. I mentioned a while ago, and Tolkien. Mm. Uh, it needs to find a home. Mm -hmm. I don't need to publish. I don't mm -hmm. have any uh, mm -hmm. gain at a university. You know, no, no raise in position or pay. So, yeah. but but the essay is done essentially, and I would like to get that out. And I meet with friends once a month by Zoom, who oh. other who write on Tolkien and. Uh, we used to meet once a year somewhere in the in uh, the country, but after the pandemic, we've taken to meeting sure. once a uh, month. Online, virtual meetings, sure, but more often. Yeah, yeah. So what advice would you have for anyone in their 70s, 80s, 90s to live a wholesome, vibrant life? What 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 tips? Can you share? Keep gratitude hmm. for all. The, it, think how unlikely it is that we exist, that you and I exist at all. Hmm. And we're, we're a piece of the universe who that is capable of looking at the universe and to some hmm. extent understanding it. Hmm. It's remember that am, amazing ability and, and, Keep doing the, the joyful things, the things that you like to do as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Keep meeting new friends. I've been seeing on my tablet several little mini essays that can you still make new friends after college mm. or after high school? And I think, what are they talking about? <laughs> of course you can make new friends. Can. And yeah. very, very good friends, too. Yeah. 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 So to keep that connection, that social interaction, right. connection, links, sure. Yeah. Keep doing what you love. And uh, I like what you said there. Focus on what you can do, not not dwell on what you can't do anymore. Jumping card tables. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> here where I live in the small community, I often say that you'd have to look long and hard to find someone you can't learn something from. Mm. Mm -hmm. Of course. We're always and learning. Yes, we're always learning. People. Yeah. My dog is scratching on the door. He yeah, I hear if you hear a squeak coming over yeah. in your podcast, there um, she is. Maybe looking for a little attention. You've been devoted to this podcast all this I time. My son had them off, but <laughs> I this one has escaped. <laughs> so, any uh, any final recommendations for our listeners? Um, some some good tips there. Or any any other thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, get over yourself. Uh -huh. I think as you get older, you see that more and more, and I have a little bit of a quibble with the self-love theme that goes on nowadays. Yes, you don't want to resent yourself, dislike yourself, despise yourself by no means, but so much good comes from doing for others. And think the human race has survived because we've been there for each other and reached out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, love yourself, but maybe love your neighbor and others more as much as you can. Yeah. And love the world. Did you say get over yourself? Was that? I did. You did. That's, I just want to repeat that. I like that. Let's put the spotlight on that. Get over yourself. Not too not too centered. Not too much spotlight on ourselves. But how we are in the world. How we connect with others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. And yeah. it's easier as you get older, at least for me. Yeah. Uh, and, and my friends to not yeah. take offense or to yeah. take a suggestions yes. from other people to be wrong mm. it just gets yeah. easier i yeah. think back on the first high school reunion where everybody was wanting to show everybody else just mm. how very well they're doing um mm. it's kind of impressive and that should go <laughs> it means, doesn't mean you do less well but it just means you you open up you open up and give up 
trying to be perfect, right? We give up yep. on being perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you bet. That's, that's, a, that's a no win race. Yeah. Uh, how can people buy a copy of your book? Is it available on Amazon or? It is. It's coming out on the 15th. I huh? can show you a copy of it. It's next week. The New Cadets. Okay. And uh, I find that very strong pastel. I think, well, ever since Barbie came out, it may not be pink, but pastels are strong in, oh, that, yeah. Yeah. in that cover. Um, it The publishing house is Gabbro Head, mm -hmm. and that's spelled G-A-B-B-R-O, new word, head. It's a rock formation in the Midwest, and the press is named after that. Mm -hmm. So just look look for the new cadets mm -hmm. or you look for gabbro press yeah okay. gabbro head press you'll find it yeah uh on the cover the dog is that a um is that a toy dog or a real dog this this dog was a toy dog he's in flesh form now in okay. across over the world and the illustrations are done by a neighbor friend uh -huh. of mine uh, mm -hmm. One of those new friends you can still make, and she's got all these uh, oh, wonderful great. points through it. She was an that. artist who hadn't been into il illustration, <clears throat> but she and then mm -hmm. uh, my daughter was uh, went to art schools back east, and it was uh, lower level to be doing illustration. You have mm -hmm. to be doing oil paintings. Hmm. And that was the Cooper Union, New York, or RISD, Rhode Island School mm -hmm. of Design, to she went to. My friend Carolyn Wilhelm, the illustrator, had the same thing. You know, illustration, it's when you teach in an English department, writing is low oh. and teaching literature is lofty. Oh. Silly, stupid thinking. I taught a um, course, even towards the, the end of my career, on writing for science. One of my published books is on local geology of all things mm. and and it's great fun to take a concept and make it comprehensible for everyone for a regular human being yeah. and you don't look down on teaching writing you don't look down on illustration all of these all of these things are wonderful and demanding and essential difficult. challenging yeah, it's very difficult yep. to translate that sure yeah mm -hmm. yeah well Good luck with the sales. Uh, it sounds like a great book. I'd like to pick out the copy myself. I like Please the do. sound of it. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to remind my listeners, by G, um, to visit my website, livingtoanhundred.club, and sign up for my email list and download a free copy of my nine tips to make living longer enjoyable. And if you're affiliated with a senior living setting or community, be sure to look for my training manual, Better, Longer, and Happier. Bye, G. Thanks so much for being a guest on our program today. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Great. Well, you're welcome. You're most welcome.